I V M. Hello and welcome to a brand new episode of the Musafir Stories. India's very own travel podcast where each week we discuss the story of travelers in their own words and reel up their experiences with you our listeners. Hi guys, I'm your host Saif and welcome to a brand new episode of the Musafir Stories. Before we get on with today's episode, a quick shout out to Sarath Nair, one of our avid listeners from Kerala. Do check out Sarath's Instagram handle called this guy was here for some brilliant countryside and portrait photography. Thank you, Sharath, for your continued support to the podcast. As for today's episode, we take you back to the mountains with our guest, Saurabh from Mumbai. Saurabh authors the blog, A Season of Mountains, where he has extensively written about his experience trekking in the Sahyadris or the Western Ghats. So sit back and enjoy as we find out where Saurabh is taking us to today. So with that introduction, I'd like to welcome Saurabh from the blog, A Season of Mountains. Saurabh, thank you so much for being a part of the Musafir Stories and welcome to the podcast. Thanks a lot. Thank you for having me on the show. I've been following your podcast since the last year and I enjoy listening to them. Thank you. Thank you so much. It is our pleasure, Saurabh, to have you and we're really, really looking forward to the conversation. But uh, before that, the introduction I gave about you is quite concise. So why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit more about you, your blogging journey and how your blog, uh, Season of Mountains, started. Yeah, sure. So I'm based in Mumbai and my blogging journey started actually two years back, but the travel bug bit me a long time before that. Okay. Uh, uh, it's actually the imaginary travel bug because I was enamored with the mountains because of uh, stories of Ruskin Bond. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, actually, that's pretty weird for a lot of people because uh, we had a story in our school about mountains. A, a cherry tree was the name of the story and that's how I got, I got enamored by the mountains. Uh-huh. And uh, it was in 2011 that I went for my first trek. A little while later, mm-hmm. uh, we started trekking regularly. But then I found out that when, that when I wanted to look up certain info, it was not there okay. uh, on certain trek blogs. So I started uh, thinking, why should not I start on myself and put all that info, which I did not find on other blogs, on my blog. Mm-hmm. And that's how A Season of Mountains was born in 2016. And it's been two years and about 40, 45 tricks. And here we are. Awesome. That's a lovely story. And I love the romance that your love for the mountains was actually started by Ruskin Bond in the story. So that's awesome. And we look forward to reading more about the stories about all the seasons of the mountains in your future blog posts. And uh, for the reference of our listeners, we will include links to Saurabh's blog and his wonderful treks that he's done with his friends in the show notes section of the podcast. So you can head there and read more about his wonderful adventures and stories. So, Saurabh, now that we have the basics laid out, what we usually do with the podcast, with the Musafir stories, is that whenever we have a guest traveler come speak with us, we request them to take us and our listeners on a journey and uh, cover all the aspects and share all the experiences that the guest has had during the course of that journey. Everything from uh, how one gets there, uh, how they went about the planning, things to see, things to do, all the activities, the kind of brush you had with the people there, the experiences say, with the culture or the food, everything from A to Z about that place and about that journey. So with that in mind, where are you taking us and our listeners to today? So I'll be taking our listeners to the port of Harihar, located in the upper Vaitana range. Okay. And we'll be covering the trek uh, as we had attempted in the December of 2016, mm-hmm. all the way from Mumbai and uh, to Harihar and back in the space of a day. Excellent. So this is a day trek that Saurabh has done. And I was really excited when um, we spoke about this uh, or uh, when we 
conversed with Saurabh about this the first time, given the sheer um, gravity-defying trek, if I may <laughs> put it that way. Uh, because yes, I just, yeah, just give our listeners a little bit of a background in that sense, because uh, this is not uh, your average trek, right, Saurabh? It's uh, very different and very unique in that sense. So uh, give us a little bit of a background about what is special about Harrier Fort and um, the history attached to this, as well as like the uniqueness in terms of the uh, inclined and everything. Absolutely. Actually, if anybody does Google Haria, the first image that springs up is the uh, a vertigo-inducing staircase. <laughs> That's nearly vertical. It actually is. And that was the thing that attracted me to uh, Harihar in the first place. Harihar is actually a fort in the upper Vaidana range. Right. And uh, I'm not too sure, but according to what I have read, it was built during the uh, Yadavas of Devagiri dynasty, which uh, which stretched from 880 to 1300 AD. So we are looking at an 800 to 1000 year old fort. Wow. Okay. And it has quite a lot of history attached to it. And that is partly due to its uh, peculiar location. We'll touch upon that in a while. Okay. So it has actually changed a lot of hands over the years from the Yadavas to the Mughals to Marathas and eventually to the British. Right. And the reason for its famed uh, uh, history and importance is that it overlooks a very traditionally important route between Gujarat and Maharashtra. It uh, was a trade route. Uh, that was the basic reason behind uh, building it in the first place, because whoever controls the forts, the passes and stuff controls the region. That is how the dynasties came to uh, value the fort. And that is how people tried to conquer it in the first place. So wonderful. That's some history. So I just was curious as to who you went on this trek with. Uh, actually, we have, I have been trekking with my friends uh, ever since I started trekking, and that's how I prefer it. And uh, this trek especially was planned with close friends of mine, okay. uh, who are the ones who regularly go on treks with me. So there were six other people beside me. Okay, so this is like a big-ish group. So <laughs> I'm sure you had a lot of fun, and um, I can't wait to hear all the lovely stories that you guys experienced on this trek. Uh, what time of the year did you say you decided to travel? Uh, we actually uh, traveled in during December of 2016, so that comes okay. as winter uh, winter in the Indian uh, subcontinent. If somebody is planning to visit Haria, it can actually be done all year round. Uh, monsoon is actually a very good time to visit sure. if one is an experienced trekker, because the uh, steepness and the challenges of the fort actually increase manifold during the monsoon season, because it's windy and it's rainy, and so you are dealing with a lot more factors which can affect your safety. Absolutely. Uh, one has to know, take note of that. Lovely. Now that you've given us a little bit of a background on this, why don't you go on and tell us a little bit more about the point when we have gotten to like the day of the trek or just the day before the trek. But what does one need to kind of say prepare in terms of fitness or the level of the trek? Uh, how, how difficult is this trek? Uh, it is actually graded as moderately difficult for people who have been trekking regularly and at the ultra experience people do actually find it easy because it's not much of a distance to cover or even the elevation gain right. uh, so it comes as a moderate grade trek because mm. uh, it, it happens over a distance of three and a half kilometers so it's not like very steep except okay. for the staircase path okay. there are no technical sections as such so you, you don't really need to carry ropes or any other technical gear you just need to have a good backpack if you are going in the monsoon then a poncho would do good or a raincoat okay. and a good pair of trekking shoes will be all that you need to go on a trek okay i think now we have most of the preparation and uh, the planning in the background about the trek done so take us take us and our listeners with you and uh, take us through this journey right from the day you headed off to the trek and your ascent all the way to the top of the fort and back take us with you Sarah. Sure, we'll do that. As I said, we had figured that we should be doing this trek on a weekday. And since we were looking at the fact on of December, when everybody has already uh, planned their New Year, the space between Christmas and New Year, uh -huh. so we had a very small window uh, to fit the trek into. Now, the thing is that we, the nine other people who we who were planning to go on the trek had decided that we'll go on a Tuesday. Okay. Uh, but somehow one person, that's a Shahzul, uh -huh. who really wanted to come on the trek and even we wanted him to be on the trek because he's a lot of fun on the treks. <laughs> so he, he was visiting his hometown, which happens to be Kankavli in the Konkan belt of Maharashtra. Okay. And he had some work and he was not going to be able to travel before Monday. Mm. 
So we were thinking of going on a trek on Tuesday and Shadul was going to start uh, the evening before. Uh-huh. Uh, the, our journey was such that we were going to start from CST, pass to Thane, Kalyan, Kasara. And then from Kasara, we were going to take a deep to the base village, which happens to be near Pada. Okay. And from then, we were going to ascend to Haryar. Mm-hmm. And the return journey was going to be similar. Okay. Now, it so happens that the first common station on the Kankavli CST and CST uh, Kasara route is Thane. Okay. And our train was going to reach, a local train that we were planning to take was going to reach Thane at around 6 a.m. And the only train which Shardul could take so that he could hop onto the local train was uh-huh. the Konkan Rajarani Express from, from the Konkan region. So the evening before we got to Neda, we got to know that the trains were running a little late and then we started thinking about alternate plans, what we could do to reach Kasara as early as possible in case we happened to miss the first train. Okay. So we stayed up the night, kept a tab on the running sets of the train and thankfully the train did cover up the delay past Rajarani and reached Thane on time. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and uh, just then, the first person of our group who starts the furthest, which happens to be Anupama, okay. started from CST. Okay. And, and then we met at Thane and boarded on the, lo- the local train. And that's yeah. how our trek actually began. Okay, so even before uh, the trek began, uh, there is a happy ending or uh, a happy beginning, if I if I could say. A crazy happy beginning, <laughs> if I could put it that way. Absolutely. I was wondering if it'll turn out to be... Uh, like a nightmare uh, reminds me of the movie oh, Jab, yeah. Jab We Met right where she <laughs> keeps missing trains and all of that uh, so yeah. <laughs> actually if I, I think if I had dozed off that night I would have actually got nightmares of missing that train <laughs> so it, it would have been very close to that movie yes that's wonderful so now you guys are all united or reunited if I may yes. and uh, yes. now you're ready to make your journey onwards towards Kasara you said Yes, absolutely. We were ready to rock and roll and then we were stuffing our mouths because as you <laughs> uh, cause as you know, we were starting very early and that have that one of the trade off that of starting very early is that you don't have the chance to have a proper breakfast. Right. So we use the ultra long train journey. It uh, it takes about two and a half hours to travel from C S T to Kasara. Oh, okay. So we used that journey to have a breakfast in the train uh-huh. and we reached Kasara at daybreak. That was about seven thirty. Okay. And our plan route was such that we were going to take shared jeeps from Kasara to Kodala and from Kodala to Nirgutpara. Okay. That was our plan. So mm-hmm. when we came out of the station, we started looking for uh, sharing jeeps to uh-huh. take us to Kodala. And from then, we were planning to go on to Nirgutpara. Okay. And was there a twist here as well or uh, everything? Plenty. Plenty. <laughs> <laughs> Plenty. Uh, okay. This this trip is actually memorable for all the things that did not go to according to the plan. <laughs> I, I really can't say for all the wrong reasons, but uh, it looks like all the fun reasons. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. They were. So what happened is like we uh, we came out of the station and all the cabs started hounding us. The, mm-hmm. As I said, Kasara, Igatpuri and these are the main transport hubs. So you get a lot of cabbies standing there trying to woo passengers into their cab for taking them into various destinations. Sure. So we, as soon as we stepped out onto the station, we got started getting hounded by the cabbies for Nashik, but we were looking for a cheap uh, to Kodala. Okay. And that's when a certain cabbie approached us and he asked us, where do we want to go? And we told him that we wanted to Kodala. And he said, like, from Kodala, where, uh, where on to? Uh-huh. And we told him we planned to trek to Harihar. Okay. And for that, we need, need to reach Nigurpara. Right. Now, it so happens that I'm talking about the 2016 rates from what I had researched and what I found out. Mm. Like it takes 50, per, 50 rupees per seat to reach Kodala from Kasara. And again, from Kodala to Nigurpara, it takes you another 50 rupees. So we are looking okay. at a 200 rupee round trip. Okay. So we told him that and he said, like, okay, fine. How many people are you? And we told him that we were about seven people because two people could not make it to the trip. Right. So he said, okay, fine. I have an Omni and you can hop onto it and we, I'll charge you a lump sum amount of 2000 rupees for the round trip. Okay. And then we did, uh, spoke amongst ourselves and decided, that, okay, fine. So there are transport issues at Nebur Pada for returning. Okay. Because uh, it's, a, it's a very nondescript village of the region. Okay. So what happened that after a certain point of the day, you do not get transport to reach Kasara or Igatpuri or any other place. Right. So when he said that they will charge us 2000 rupees, we figured out that like paying 85 rupees extra on top of that was not a bad idea if we had a confirmed ride back. Right. So we were like, fine, absolutely. We'll take you on for it. And he said, hop on. Okay. Uh, and that's how we started from Kasara. Okay. 
So uh, before starting the journey, he was like, we were start, we were planning to sit in the Omni, and he was talking to another cabbie in hushed tones. So <laughs> that is when I like, like that that Bollywood thing is that it started like rearing its head up, like okay, fine guys, maybe there's something fishy going on here. And so I switched on Google Maps and decided to keep a tab on the route that he was taking. Okay. <laughs> and uh, since everybody was hungry, we told him that uh, maybe if you could uh, if you could stop on the on route to have a quick bite, it would be great. And he said, absolutely. Okay. So we start from Kasara at 8 a.m. Uh, he's traveling at a good speed and about 10 minutes into the right, we are taking the highway. And suddenly he veers onto the left and takes a kacha road. And uh, before like, we could think what is happening and stuff, we see a dhaba. And then we like the hungry people that we are, uh-huh. we, we decided, okay, fine, he's taking us to the dhaba. So everybody's like smiling and stuff. And then he zooms past the dhaba. <laughs> okay. And then we're thinking, what is he up to? And he's like, it happens in the movies, like he, he's traveling at a great spin and suddenly he breaks, brings it to a uh-huh. running halt. Okay. Right behind a dilapidated structure. Okay. <laughs> yes. Uh, so he he parks us behind a dilapidated structure and looks back at us and says, "Wait, I'll be back in a minute." Opens the door and runs off through that dilapidated structure. And then we are like, <laughs> "What is happening?" Yeah, especially especially given your ride, right? You uh, did you mention that you uh, were taking an Omni Maruti Omni? Omni. Oh, <laughs> Absolutely, it has a very great reputation for being the kidnapping car of Bollywood. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, that's where, that's where I was getting to. <laughs> Official <laughs> kidnapping car of Bollywood, yes. <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. So go on, like a few nail biting moments there, and uh, what what came out of it? Uh, so we were thinking, like well, he did not tell us why he had parked, and all we we looked around, and we all we could see was like a field on our left, and mountains beyond, not a soul inside. On our right was that dilapidated structure, and we could not see. We were essentially shield from the highway as well. Okay. So we started thinking, what is happening? And so I thought that okay, fine, maybe we should go into that defense kind of shell <laughs> and so i brought out my kara kara okay. is basically the holy bracelet holy solid steel bracelet of the six sure yeah i've seen that and so me and manish we walk out of the car and into the dilapidated structure uh-huh. and as we walk into it and the and everything that is wrong starts creeping up into my head because i see like mossy walls uh piles of furniture at one end of the room it's a dinghy room no no lighting any any such thing okay it's like shit this thing's my <laughs> this might be a bad thing and then me and manisha looking at each other and then we can't find melinba melinba was the name of the cabbie okay okay so we have no sight of melinba we can see the dhaba across uh, across the structure huh? and then we decide that we should go back to the cab and decide what to do next right. so we walk back to the cab and everybody's come out and they are wondering what on earth is happening over here uh-huh. And just then, Ms. Malin Bhau huffing and puffing, running all the way from the dhaba, clutching a few notes in his hand. Okay. And <laughs> as he saw, he saw our faces, and it might have struck him that okay, fine, these people are thinking, fearing the worst. So as soon as he approaches the car, he's like, like it's a gas barajia. He's a Maharashtrian. Okay. So he says gas barajia, which is basically I will fuel the car. Uh, and okay. saying that, yeah, and he's saying <laughs> that he rushes to the back of the car and opens the dicky. And we, at this point of time, we are still not trusting him because right, right. like, who does this? Like, actually, <laughs> at least stand for a minute and tell us what's happening happening right yeah it uh, really sounds like a madhouse at this point but i'm just glad that everything is ending um, on a happy note yeah it is at that point of time you we were very relieved <laughs> laughing at our foolishness and decided maybe let belin bhau carry uh, carry on with his refueling and go grab a bite in the dhaba awesome <laughs> i'm really glad and uh, the suspense ended well so that's a good thing so now after having a quick bite how far away are we from um uh, Nirgut Pada, did you say? That was the name of the base village? Yes. Okay. Yes, that's Nirgut Pada, and we were about like 40 kilometers from the Nirgut Pada, but the rest of the journey was uneventful. Once we started uh, back from the Dhaba, For a we covered the. Go- yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we covered the rest of the journey in quick time, and we were at, at, at 10 a.m. We were right at the base village looking at the mighty fort that is Haria. Awesome. So uh, give us a little bit of a description as to what you see when you get there. Like, um, are there mountains all around or this is uh, like a solitary mountain fort that you're looking at? How is the view around? So Harihar is not a solitary mountain as such. It is located in the upper Vaitana range or also known as the Trimbakeshwar range. Right. 
So uh, it is actually a cluster of mountains running in the the east west direction. Uh-huh. So the first mountain that you uh, that you see while reaching Nirgut Para happens to be Utward. It's a mountain okay. followed by another fort which is Baskar or mm-hmm. also known as Baskar. Okay. Passing that, you reach Nirgut Para and standing in front of you is the mighty fort known as Harihar. Sure. Uh, there's a straight cliff. As soon as you reach Harihar, what strikes you is the almost straight cliff of Harihar that uh, that is like bang opposite Nirgut Para. Mm. And it is famous too. Uh, actually, in 1986, the famous mountaineer Douglas Scott uh-huh. climbed it. Okay. So in 1986, he climbed it and after his name, it started becoming known as the Scottish Kada. Okay. Kada is basically cliff in Marathi. Okay. So okay. Uh, once you reach Nirgut Para, you see called Scottish Kada. Mm-hmm. And if you turn around, you see a plethora of other mountains. You have Brahma Hill, you have Apada Hill, and then you have uh, uh, Brahmagiri, Bandar Durg, and there's Satsha Hill. There are plenty of mountains and plenty okay. of other places to visit as well. So yeah, you stand in Nirgut Para and you're surrounded by mountains and all, and it's a blissful sight. Mm-hmm. So we started from Nirgut Para and past Kotamwadi, which happens to be a hamlet a little further of Nirgut Para. Mm-hmm. And then we started our scenic walk through the paddy fields. It takes about a, like, a kilometer, that's about 15 minutes of walking before the actual uphill still starts. Okay, okay. Uh, rest of the part until the Harihar Fort steps is not that uh, long. We reached at around 12.30, I guess. We were uh, looking at Harihar Fort head on. Okay. And the famed staircase as well. Yeah. Now, it so happens that I like to touch on why this staircase is actually so famous. Mm-hmm. Now, when the when the forts were being acceded to the British Empire back in the uh, 18th century right. and the 19th century, uh, one one strategy that the British employed to make sure that the forts were not again used against them mm-hmm. was to destroy the entrances of the fort. So mm-hmm. that is how. A, a lot of the forts in your in your Sayadri belt do not have proper entrances because the British they did what the British did was destroy the main entrances to the fort so nobody else can take control of the fort and control the region after that. Mm, so uh, Captain Briggs was the officer of the British army who was in charge of destroying the entrance to Farrier Fort. Okay. But legend has it and it has he has actually left a very detailed account of this. Mm-hmm. When he went there along with his troop to destroy the entrance of the fort, he actually got so awestruck by the beauty of it mm. The you have like 60 61 meters of almost straight staircase, rocket staircase, beautifully carved into the mountain yeah. that he, he decided that he would not he would not destroy it at any cost. And wow. so he ordered the true bags and that is how we have the beautiful site greeting us today. Wow. Yeah, that's some story, right? Uh, as as you mentioned, uh, these steps that are at almost an incline of what? 80, 80 degrees, yes. Uh, see, uh, various accounts put it at 60 to 80 degrees, but I'll say it is closer to 80 degrees. That is, that is what it feels like while you're climbing or descending. Right. <laughs> so so uh, it's almost like you're uh, climbing on a vertical ladder, literally. And given that uh, these are rock cut steps, especially during the monsoons and all, it's uh, really an ad- adventure in itself, right? It is because you're looking at uh, steps of like two feet high yeah. and then you have a valley, a valley behind you and almost vertical steps. It gives you an adrenaline rush like Absolutely. nothing else. Absolutely. Yeah, take us with you. Uh, how long did it take for you guys to conquer these steps and uh, reach your first pit stop? It actually depends on the person. As a very fit person, I've seen uh, I've seen videos of like people to who are do trekking regularly uh-huh. climb up these steps in two minutes, literally two minutes. Uh-huh. And if some person is struggling with vertigo or if somebody is acrophobic, uh, has a few of heights, then it will take him a good fifteen minutes to climb the steps. Okay. But it's about two hundred feet of steps. It should take any fit person who does not have fear of heights uh, at the most five to seven minutes to climb, and that is what it took us. And okay. the other thing is that when you're doing this, you are actually coming to the fort for experiencing the staircase. It does not make sense to rush through it. Sure. You should take in the experience. It is not every day that you will be hanging mid a uh, hundred feet from your closest ground and looking <laughs> back and viewing fair mountains all around you. Absolutely. So absolutely. that is one thing that attracted us, and it is uh, experience to remember as well. Sure. Uh, once at the end of these five to seven or ten minute uh, climb, uh, what's the first point you reach, Saurabh? Uh, that happens to be the Mahadarwaza. It's been recently painted. It's a semicircular, semicircular door okay. to the fort. It's called as Mahadarwaza. Okay. So once you climb the steps, 
uh, you are looking at the Mahadarbaza and on the on your left is the Harshivadi. Mm. And if you turn and look out from the Mahadarbaza, you're looking at the, uh, the three hills in front of you, which is Fani Dongar, Utward okay. Mountain and the Basgar Mountain. Wow, that must have been some site, right? Yeah, it is actually. Uh, very few sites compared to that because you have a very beautiful frame in front of you. You have a door in front of you. And if you see through it, you have three mountains adorning the range. Very few sites compared to that. Lovely, lovely. So how are all of you doing at this point in terms of, uh, say, fitness or uh, even in terms of uh, just the general mood of the group? How is it? It was ecstatic. We were all ecstatic because it was the, there was this adrenaline rush of uh, going through the steps. And then again, it was not a very long trip. We had barely covered about three kilometers. And we are usually habituated to covering a good distance during a regular trek. The longest that we have done in a day is 28 kilometers. Three kilometers was a very, what do you say, easy trek for okay. most of the people of the group. Okay. So we were very happy physically in a good condition. And uh, you, uh, as soon as the Mahadarbaza, uh-huh. you're looking at a passage carved out of sheer rock, your left. And uh, this very cool breeze flowing uh, through the passage. And then you are like hungry. And then we decided, <laughs> because it was a weekday, there were not many people. So we had almost the entire food to us. And so we decided why not have food, or, or food there and there. Okay. And that's how we had lunch in the passage overlooking beautiful mountains at 1 p.m. <laughs> Lovely. And then just to um, kind of call that out, uh, is it preferable that one carries his or her own food? Or yes. uh, is this something uh, that's available before you start off? It's preferable that you carry your own food. The one thing that you'll have to take care about is there are monkeys on the mountain. So you should uh, ideally take your own food along. But in case you, are, you don't have your own food there are several, several shacks uh, selling them uh-huh. before the staircase so even if you do not if it's an impromptu or something like that you can actually take uh, buy bottled water or food from there as well but if you have been planning this beforehand it's very uh, it's preferable that you carry your own food along so now that you've had uh, lunch with a beautiful view, I'm sure, and um, in the in the middle of the sky, as you said, uh, hanging hanging in the <laughs> air, uh, what do you what did you guys do next? Like, uh, is there more to the fort? Like, tell us what you're seeing around you. Plenty more. Okay. Plenty more. Uh, th- this is just the first part. You have the feet of stairs, and then you have the helical staircase, oh, almost okay. as steep as the first one but actually overlooking the valley with no support as such. So you have one point where you are actually turning back 180 degrees with a sheer drop of 500 feet on your left and a narrow staircase on your right. Okay, so that's... So that the... is one other, uh, another point of interest for someone looking for an adrenaline rush. Now, I was going to say that uh, looks like the drama is still ahead, right? <laughs> Yes, there is. So we, it's a beautiful fort. It's very beautifully constructed. And if you think about it in terms of military military point of view, there have been plenty of trap doors because uh, uh, Captain Briggs in his account said that as, uh, it's such a impregnable fort that only five people can hold it against wow. an entire army. Because as soon as you pass through the helical steps, you have to pass through another trap door. A trap door is basically a four by four feet of gap through which you have to pass. So even if you have a thousand strong army, the most that can pass through it is one person at a time. Right, right. And when you have one person at a time passing through it, it actually renders your entire army useless. Yeah. And uh, even passing through that trap door is an uh, uh, acrobatic, uh, acrobatic activity in itself because uh-huh. you have to maneuver around the steps and then climb out of the trap door and then you reach the second entrance of the fort. And now you are officially on the plateau of the Fort Harihar. Lovely. And uh, it does it does give you that sense of going back in time, right? And uh, thinking about how people uh, thought or uh, their thought process, right? While designing and while constructing forts. And uh, it is so complex. You might think that it's just going to be a simple construction, but it's so complex, right? The thinking. Yes, actually, they have thought about everything. Uh, even even after designing such an impregnable fort, they had thought of a way to escape in case they do uh, suffer defeat at the hands of the enemy. So after you pass the second door, okay. in front of you is a narrow rocker passage. Hmm. And if you look closely, you'll see steps in it as well. Now, what you're looking at is the Chor Darwaza, the secret door, the secret passageway to escape from the fort in case of an army uh, army invading the fort. Unfortunately, due to the exposed nature of the Chor Darwaza, it was 
most of the times the chauth darwaza pe sajjad dev hai leading straight into the valleys hmm. so uh, coupled with the peculiar location of the harrier fort dendi over there right uh, and the location of the chauth darwaza the lower part of the chauth darwaza has been blown away by the winds so you only have the upper part of the chauth darwaza in front of you but it's a beautiful sight hmm. and it gives you gives you an idea about the kind of thought that they gave to constructing the forts back in the days absolutely and it uh, really like brings out your imagination right <laughs> and especially tied with your background of reading books and stories and uh, tie that to this uh, beautifully constructed fort with the trap doors and the escape doors and everything uh, i think it must have been like a <laughs> proper mix of adventure yeah actually it gives you imagination of flight uh, seeing all these things unfolding in front of your eyes the trap door the secret passage ways the carefully constructed doors and stuff and water systems contingency plans it's a fantasy land for someone like me <laughs> or even someone someone who's has an inclination for the history absolutely absolutely so lovely now that you've um, passed through the section of the fort with the trap second. door and the escape door and yeah the second uh, flight of stairs right so where does this lead you to right leads you on to the hanuman mandir hanuman okay. mandir and the pond okay. and the pond what you have here is you first you come across the hanuman mandir on mm-hmm. its right is a shivling a shivling is basically a holy representation of the god shiva right and behind it is a beautiful square pond uh, which you can descend into but not as actually advised because there have been a lot of untoward incidents recently people who don't know swimming entering and then drown stuff so it's usually not advised to enter it but it's a beautiful sight you mm-hmm. have the pond and you have the brahma hill on your left okay. so you have the pond and the hill adorning the view and it's a beautiful sight Okay. And on your right, if you see, you have the peak of Harihar with the flag flying in the wind. Okay, so uh, if you have to draw this out for the listeners, what we have uh, basically done is we've we've gone up that the, the two flights of vertical stairs and we've reached uh, the part of the hill. If I may, that's more of a plateau on which there's this the Hanuman Mandir and Hanuman the Hanuman Mandir, Hanuman Temple. So we are looking at the Hanuman Temple and the pond behind it, and on our right is the peak of Harihar. Now, okay. if somebody is uh, some want to, uh, wants to explore the fort, they can actually pass the pond, and there's a trail leading to the only structure remaining from the olden days, which happens to be the Kothi. Okay. Uh, Kothi is basically a storage room. Uh, some places, uh, some accounts refer to it as the palace as well, but I doubt it is a palace because it was a basically a military stronghold. it's okay. a beautiful structure beautiful square rectangular structure and it has a partition in the middle of it mm. so more like a garrison uh, probably right garrison yes yeah. uh, used for storing ammunition back in the days okay so okay. you you can enter it through a very small window it's clean right now as far as i know uh, at least was when i visited it's a different experience to be in the claustrophobic if somebody is like not used to small places uh-huh. but the people who have been trekking regularly are used to like walking into the caves and stuff they are they are enjoy it it's a it's a different experience the light entering through the window and uh, the small space but it's beautifully constructed from the inside okay. so you can visit that come back out again and there are a few more ponds water systems actually okay. beyond the kothi Mm-hmm. and uh, as you reach the western end of the fort you can see uh, the rest of the upper vaitana range in front of you okay and then uh, so uh, uh, how much right. more higher are we talking about 5 minutes 5 minutes okay. at the most but okay. once you once you are at the western fort you turn back round and take the other trail which have leads you to the peak of the fort it's a 5 minute trail and as soon as you are the, uh, there's a rock patch before you reach the highest point of the hill so you're standing at the ro- standing at the base of the rock patch there are two very simple patches of about 5 at 5 to 6 feet uh-huh. anybody can do it with no experience of rock climbing well mm. pass them and bingo you are on the top of the fort enjoying a panoramic view of the surroundings lovely <laughs> tell us tell us i mean uh, you you probably made it really quickly there given the experience you guys already have with trekking but uh, how's the how's the view there and how's the feeling i mean finally accomplishing something that you had come for reaching the top of the fort it is lovely actually or whatever whatever you do the layer of summit is something that can be put into words uh-huh. like standing on top of the place and seeing everything you is a different experience altogether sure. and standing there even in the afternoon sun we were so happy that we did not have give a damn about the afternoon heat bearing down on us <laughs> and all we could see were beautiful panoramic views the the dam on the southern side the beautiful surroundings we could actually see the both the base villages of the fort at that point of time the harshwadi as well 
well as Nirgut Pada. Oh, okay. And uh, there's the saffron flag, which is, uh, it's called the Bhagwa, Bhagwa Jhenda in Marathi. Okay. It is it is a symbol of the Maratha Empire. It is placed on the top of the forts as a pay, way of paying homage to the warrior king of Maratha, Shivaji Maharaj. Mm. So it flies high on the fort and it's symbolic of the peak. So you have the fort next to you and you're watching the surrounding and it's a peculiar feeling. It's a beautiful feeling after uh, trekking and taking the pins to conquer the fort. Not conquer the fort, climb the fort. I prefer saying climbing the fort because you don't conquer a mountain. The, the mountain lets you climb it. Absolutely, absolutely. That's, uh, I think, very nicely put. So how much time did you guys spend there? Uh, we spent about half an hour on the top. Since we were going on a weekday, we had the uh, fort to ourselves, except a couple of other groups, and it was a beautiful feeling. And then looking at the time, we decided to time to move on and uh, start our descent. Yeah, because you already have that uh, deadline of 5 p.m. by which you have to get back, right? So yes. uh, you are kind of uh, running against time. So um, how about the descent? I know you're going back through the same route and all of that, but a descent compared to the ascent is a challenge in itself, right? Especially when you are looking at a, a vertical flight of stairs that's almost like 90 degrees. I mean, you didn't travel there in monsoon, but it uh, like throws up its own challenges, right? It is. Descents are always more challenging than the ascent because ascending, you are not actually looking back at the exposure. Then again, your body is fresher and then have something looming on your head like the deadline that we had. Sure. So we started down from the peak of the fort mm-hmm. and uh, another nightmare of ours, uh-huh. jam on the stairs for we are actually avoiding the weekends happened there. Okay, uh, so tell me a little bit more about that. Yeah, you planned it on a weekday, so uh, you still ran into a jam? Yes, we did. Unfortunately, <laughs> as I said, this is a trek where almost nothing went to plan, but it's still a memorable one. Uh-huh. So what happened is while we were climbing on the uh, climbing uh, the fort, we had spoken with a few of the locals and they told uh, not many people visit the fort on weekdays, but today there was a group of 50 odd kids who were climbing the fort, who had okay. climbed before us. And oh. as soon as we reached the stairs, we saw the whole 50 p or 50 strong group descending very, very, very slowly along the stairs. And now we are looking at a possible jam and our worst nightmare. Oh, oh my God. Uh, this, this throws me back a little bit. And uh, now you're saying that there's a group of kids that's also on the sport. Uh, how old are these kids? And uh, it's a group of 50, you say. So were they on a school trip or something? What was this? Uh, they were actually in a summer camp. Mm-hmm. And there were 50 kids. And because uh, this was such a large group, we could not see who was leading them. But we could speak with the real lead and who happened to be a very veteran mountaineer. Okay. He had climbed AMK and led a number of tricks. And he was head of the group who had brought them yeah. They were part of uh, part of a summer camp and uh, it was a group called Trek uh, Get Out, if I remember right. Okay. Get Out, yes. Okay. Uh, that's very, very heartwarming to hear as well. It's uh, <laughs> it's good that because uh, these days uh, the, the kids I see, like especially the kids of cousins or whoever, they're always in front of iPads and all of that. It's good that some of them are going outdoors and uh, exploring this part of uh, nature, right? It's a good thing that yes. kids are taking to outdoors. Certainly, and especially when you are doing it under the watchful eyes of somebody who's experienced enough to lead them onto it and with the safety precautions, it's a it's a very heartening heartening sight to see because you have kids being introduced to the nature at early age and then you, they can experience the joys that you have in the world apart from the electronic toys as well. <laughs> and it was a very beautiful sight, but at that point of time, we did not give it a thought because all we could see was people descending very slowly. Yeah, and uh, you were running against the 5 p.m. deadline, remember? So how did you guys deal with it? Actually, we were descending very slowly and we struck up a conversation with the rail lead, the uh-huh. veteran mountain. We told him that we were aiming to go back by the local train and there was a pickup arranged for us for a, at 5 p.m. near Nirkutpada. Uh-huh. And he said that, okay, fine, one thing, I'll let you guys pass through the passage before the rest of the kids descend the first pair of stairs, the 200 feet long stairs. Okay. So we will, uh, we thanked him and uh, it took us about 15, 20 minutes to descend the second uh, helical pair of stairs, which had taken us barely like eight to 10 minutes to climb. Right, it took right. us 15 to 20 minutes. Right. And once in the passage, he asked the uh, front lead of the group to uh, make the kids gather into the passage and let us pass by. It was a very kind gesture on his part and we thanked him for it and started descending. Absolutely. It looks like uh, somebody really level-headed because it might 
easily have uh, cost you a lot of time there, right? Had you followed we were them? Actually look, we were actually looking at a, a, an hour at least descending the stairs if we had uh, stuck behind the group. So it was very kind of him and considerate of him. But that is a, a thing of trekking in the Sayadris at least. I do not have experience trekking in other ranges, but one thing that I've seen about trekkers in the Sayadri is that they are always ready to help each other out. It's a very uh, looking out for each other kind of yeah. uh, experience that you have on yeah. the treks. Uh, the camaraderie, it, right? Yeah. Yes, and it leaves you with, with a very good feeling that, yes, there is somebody who actually known to you, a complete stranger who is going out of your way to do something for you. Beautiful experience. It's a good yeah. thing of helping it, uh, each other out and watching for each other. Yes, absolutely. Ah, that's been one exhilarating experience, I think, um, more so because it's been a day trip, right? So you've been literally in the middle of the action the whole while and... Uh, I mean, I'm sure given that it was with a group of friends, it would be uh, even more special and uh, more enjoyable. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for uh, taking us around this um, beautiful trail, uh, which is, I would say, not as popularly known outside of the uh, Mumbai or the Maharashtra circuit, I would say. So thank you for uh, showing that to us. But uh, um, any, any more experiences you had around the place or uh, that are available around this place? Points of interest, yes, absolutely. There mm-hmm. happens to be the, there happens to be uh, quite a few of them. You have Trimbakeshwar, which is one of the twelve Jyotirlings of India. Right. Jyotirlings is again a kind of sacred representation of God Shiva. So mm-hmm. you have twelve Jyotirlings all over India. Uh, Trimbakeshwar is one of them. It's fairly like uh, a few kilometers from Harihar. Uh-huh. You have Trimbakeshwar. Then you have another holy place known as Anjaneri. Anjaneri is considered as the birthplace of Lord Hanuman. Okay. Then you have uh, Brahma Hill. Brahma Hill is the source of the river Godavari. I'm not too sure, but I uh, I have read it somewhere that it is the source of Godavari. At least the Trimbakeshwar region is. So if somebody is looking for a multi-day itinerary, mm-hmm. from a trekking point of view, they can certainly do it. They can cover both Baskar or Baskargarh, Harihar, then go on to do Brahmagiri, Bhandardurg, and end with Anjaneri. That's a uh, six-foot uh, trek, which should take any uh, any fit trek about three days. And uh, otherwise, if somebody is looking for a tourist, what is a tourist itinerary, uh-huh. you can with Trimbakeshwar, Brahmagiri, and Anjaneri. All the places have proper prayer, cement paved steps to take them onto the places of interest. So yes, you're actually looking at. Uh, a three-day itinerary for someone who's going there to visit the holy places and you can actually find accommodation as well near these three places because they are popular with the spiritual people so you have a very well looked after accommodation places nearby lovely i think as you said though you guys did like a day trip of sorts uh, for somebody uh, for someone who is considering like a religious trail or even a Fort hopping trail, if I may, right? This I yes. think serves as a perfect destination or a, a perfect itinerary. Yes, absolutely. Right? Yeah, lovely. So thank you for taking us through this wonderful experience and taking us back in time to this lesser explored gem of Maharashtra that has changed hands between so many dynasties, uh, right from the Yadavas, like you said, to uh, the Marathas, the Mughals, the British. Uh, so something of that sort of historical significance, right? And it stands tall to tell a tale or two. So thank you so much for uh, taking us on this wonderful journey and sharing all of your experiences from that journey. We wish you all the best in your uh, treks and trails. And we look thank forward to reading more of your work from A Season of Mountains. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Seth. It's been a pleasure talking to you and I look forward to listening to more stories on your podcast as well. Thank you so much, Sarah. That was yet another great episode of The Vasafra Stories. If you guys like the show, please subscribe to us on iTunes or Apple Podcasts, Audioboom, Savan, Pocket Casts, CastBox, Stitcher or any other podcasting app available on iOS or Android. Please do leave us a review on iTunes. It goes a long way in the show's discoverability. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. We go by the handle The Musafir Stories. Or, if it suits you, you could email us at themusafirstories at gmail.com or visit our website at www.themusafirstories.com for more information. All of these links will be made available in the show notes section of each episode. So here's to more traveling, sharing, and inspiring. Stay tuned for our next episode. Until then... Happy travels and goodbye.